Welcome back to part three of Electrolytes Made Easy, a pre-recorded webinar that's part of our Picmonic lecture series. So if you're here, you've already learned the 17 Picmonics from part one and part two of this series, which is linked as a playlist in the summary below. Now let's go on to the final part of this Electrolytes Made Easy series. So let's look at sodium. The normal lab value of sodium, 135 to 145. Hmm, okay, that's, that's a lot higher than magnesium, right? I mean, we're measuring the same amount of blood. Um, and I, yeah, of course, I could have put the, you know, the, the actual size of deciliters and whatnot, but I'm not trying to teach you to memorize that. I want you to remember 135 to 145. 135 to 145, that's a relatively large extracellular volume, right? So wouldn't that make you think that this is probably in charge of extracellular excitability? Ah, put that together. That was, that was pretty smart of me, right? But what's important with extracellular is that this sodium, which is high in the extracellular space, is really sensitive to fluid balances. Well, and that makes pretty much sense to me. If sodium is high in the extracellular space and it is mostly responsible for extracellular excitability, then it would be very sensitive if you had extra fluid volume or no fluid volume. That's right, because I think about these dots. Let's say I put five or mm, what's a uh, five marbles in a in a five ounce bag. They're pretty high dense marbles, right? But I took those five marbles and then I put them in a gallon jug. Then it's not very dense. Um, if I filled the wet bags with water, I don't even know if marbles could fit in a five ounce bag. But hopefully you got the thought that you could be very dense or very um, not dense or very um, spaced out. So normal is 135 to 145. So we've got this great image in our Picmonic, and uh, it's kind of like a Christmas, I, I, I think it's a Christmas scene or a winter scene, and you can think about this 135, this 133 on a sleigh with this 144 45 reindeer, 145 uh, reindeer. So they're salting down the, um, the salt uh, here on the, um, the reindeer. So a low sodium, hyponatremia. So you're going to see this hippo salt shaker. Hippo, low, salt shaker, right? So if you have a low sodium and it's responsible for extracellular excitability, you're going to see not very much excitement, right? You're going to see muscle, or <clears throat> you're going to see maybe muscle cramps, some confusion, general weakness, lots of problems. Let's look at hypernatremia. So if you have a very large amount of um, sodium, a high amount of sodium or, or content, here's an important thing to think about both of these before I say this. So if I took my my wonderful, it's the same concept again. So I took the same um, what beautiful Picmonic Cup 37 cents and I filled it with, with salt, which I would never do. But if I filled it with salt and I filled it all the way with salt, or let's just say halfway, halfway with salt, that's 50% volume filled with salt, right? Well, but if I filled it with all the way with salt, then that would attract more um, water into there. But if it's not very much salt, then it's not going to attract a lot of water in. And uh, I hope that makes a lot of it makes sense because if you think of a low hyponatremia, there's two ways to be hyponatremic. Um, either you have um, a very large cup with a little bit of salt in it, or you have a very small cup with a lot of salt in it. I mean, there's different ways to create dilutional hyponatremia. Sometimes without a graphic, that gets really confusing. So with hypernatremia, a high high amount of salt and uh, High, hypernatremia, this hiker uh, salt shaker, you're going to see this um, thirsty. Very, you're going to see excessive thirst. Why would you see excessive thirst in a patient with hypernatremia? Well, excessive thirst, yeah, you could see it with dehydration. But the, the underlying thing is why do you see it with hypernatremia? So what you have to think about is let's say I have this cup, beautiful Picmonic cup, 37 cents for Kindle, and it's halfway full with salt and halfway full with water. So what you know is that that makes a balance, right? But if I add more salt, what happens is it will it needs to pull more water in. It has to. It needs to pull it in. Or maybe I'm dehydrated and I decrease the amount of water down, so then it knows it needs to fill the back of the way up. So it's a it's this balance. It's a ratio. So what happens is your body says, hey, I'm thirsty, and it pulls more water in. And you see that with ADH. Things like antidiuretic hormone. They create this thirst. And you're going to see a dry, flushed skin. That's really hot, dry, flushed skin you'll see with all these patients. Um, that's for sure. So I just want to show you these actual picmonics because this, this kind of um, helps you break it down um, as well. So we have a hyponatremia, so a low sodium. So if I have um, 
you know, a decrease less than 35, you're going to see this hypotonic, uh, or you're going to see less than 30, 135 uh, lab value. You might see those patients, and you'll see them here with a hippo salt shaker. You see that same character again. And we have the treatments over here for it. So there are different types of hyponatremia, a dilutional hyponatremia, or a, or a um, I'm sorry, excessive water consumption. Um, something that's really important is, you know, there are actual um, patients who drink too much water. You've heard of water intoxication, right? You, uh, a patient um, has a medical condition and they drink way too much water. Um, so if you drank, maybe you were thirsty or crazy or you have a, a problem, you drink 10 gallons of water. 10 gallons of water, then you are going to dilute the amount of fluid, the water in your body, because you can only excrete so much. And what happens is your sodium level relatively drops. So if you have a normal volume, if I took the same amount of salt that was in here, right, and I took it to here, that's salt, but then I put 10 gallons of water on top of the cup, well, it, it's going to spill it over, right? But also, I still only have the same amount of sodium. So then I took a sample of all of the 10 gallons in that one sample, it is relatively decreased. So we're going to give those patients diuretics, di-rocket, right here. We're going to get rid of that fluid. We're going to give them mannitol for increased int um, intracranial pressure. Decrease, get rid of all the fluid. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. We're going to dump as much fluid as possible because then we will save on to that, that sodium. We're going to give them um, hyper, hypotonic, hypertonic solutions, and that's going to pull, that, you know, pull those um, nutrients in. So hypernatremia is... The, Exactly the opposite, right? So you want to um, think about those because you want to. Those are way too much, way too much sodium in one spot. So it's pretty much you've dehydrated them down, and that's really where you see that most commonly is dehydration. That's why you have this scene here with this dehydration, and it's in this you know desert oasis and whatnot. And that's how you can always kind of keep each of them, keep each of them correctly, um, for sure. And that's exactly how you how you think about it. Is it? It's contrast. So. What I want to do is just quickly just put this, just do another example to just pull it together for you. So you know, I've got this this one here. It's you know cells, each cell, and each cell is a little bit different. You know, types of cells. They have these um, ion channels which allow these electrolytes to move across. You know, and some of them have pumps that allow them to move. You know, pump these many ions in, pump this many ions out. But they all work in a balance, and that's based, that's physiology 101. I'm, I didn't really enjoy my physiology class, but that physiology is very advanced. And these all these you know math calculations you can find out to find out which way it's going to shift, especially in cardiology. We know a lot about the um, my, cardiac myocytes, which is the example I'm going to show you again in just a second. I know a lot about those. So we can see lots of these changes anytime we have a disruption. So if I have lots and lots of one ion and it's not used to it, well, the cells either can't excrete what's ever inside, or the pumps don't work, or we give drugs to disrupt those pumps to purposely cause increased muscle contraction or decreased muscle contraction, like we give magnesium, which we're going to talk about again in a second. So putting it all together again, here's the cardiac myocyte from the very beginning. So we saw the same thing from the beginning, right? This is a cardiac myocyte. We've, we've, we've cut out, there's, there's some more channels on a cardiac myocyte if you're a, if you're a physiologist if that's a word. Um, so here's a cardiac myocyte, intracellular fluid volume, intracellular fluid here inside the cell. We have some potassium and we have sodium. And here's some channels that are just free flowing. Potassium normally flows out of this cardiac myocyte, normally just flows on out as much as it wants. And freely sodium flows in, flows back in. Here it is, flowing in all day long. Here it goes. Potassium flows out, sodium flows in. You know, just chilling, having a good time. But there's also this mechanism on the other side, which is an ATPase pump, which is on a cardiac myocyte, which pumps in to potassium as needed, but at the same time, it pumps out three sodium. So it pumps in two potassium, and it pumps out three sodium. And it's just a normal normal thing going about its day. It pumps it in, pumps it out, pumps it in, pumps it out, as needed, you know, to just keep balance, kind of how it works. This one on the left is just a normal, normal diffusing chill, doing whatever it wants. Is if there's lots of potassium, it flows out. Lots of potassium out, flows in. Lots of sodium out, it flows in. Just chill, because the body normally regulates this normal homeostasis amount. So there's not too much. But what happens when things go wrong, right? What happens if you have way too much potassium on the outside? Outside of the cell, 
way too much potassium. So here, way too much potassium. What happens? Well, this is a cardiac myocyte. Remember we, we talked about hyperkalemia, right? So I just I just upped the hype the potassium level like crazy. I mean this this patient right here is in renal failure and they're way increased hyper hyperkalemia. But what happens is this intracellular potassium, it doesn't want to just diffuse out. It doesn't want to just chill and have a nice time out. No, it doesn't want to. No, thank you. There's a lot of potassium on the outside. I'm going to stay in here where it's comfy and nice. But what happens is, because there is this 2-potassium, 3-sodium transporter, what happens is, well, this can't move out, so it builds up inside. But on top of that, this pump then pumps in even more. So you end up with tons and tons and tons of potassium inside of a cardiac myocyte. Now, if you remember, let's tie it all the way back to the generalized basic concept of hyperkalemia. What happens in hyperkalemia inside a cardiac myocyte? What do you see? You see arrhythmias, number one. You see tall, peaked T waves. Because there's all this potassium in here just chilling out inside of the cardiac myocytes. So they contracted, but they just want to keep contracting. So they contract and then they just really don't relax a lot. Contract, relax, contract, relax. It's contr crazy, strong, insane contractions. And that's exactly what happens. And that's how this, you see these tall, really tall, peaked T waves. Because if you didn't have any potassium, right? Let's say you had no potassium, hypokalemia. Then, well, all the potassium is just going to pump out, right? Just, hey, it's all gone, but there's no potassium to pump in. So then inside of here, this potassium can't create that tall, peaked T wave. You have a decreased T wave decrease. You know what? Repolarizing just goes meh, whatever. Meh, meh. That's how you see it. And that's really how you should think about that. Um, so, what drug, what drug here is what we need to think about? If I'm talking about this um, um, sodium, this 2 potassium, 3 sodium, this ATPase pump, what drug are you talking about here? Hmm. Digoxin. Digoxin actually blocks this sodium and potassium ATPase pump. So it blocks it here. So no more potassium can go in. And that causes this insane contraction. Not so much relaxing, insane contraction. And if you have hypokalemia, you end up with a really um, increased risk of digoxin toxicity. Um, somebody actually said insulin. And um, insulin is an interesting, uh, interesting one because if I give insulin, when do I give insulin? You know, you said insulin. When do I give? When would it be a good time that I would give insulin? Yeah, diabetes. Don't say that one. That that's cheating. You're not allowed to cheat like that. Yeah, throw that out. That doesn't count. That's the obvious choice. I'm not going to into that one. I'm not that easy. Ah, hyperkalemia. So what happens is in hyperkalemia. So if I have this high high potassium level outside the cell, insulin and beta blockers actually shift potassium in t inside of the cell because of these membrane channels. And yeah, that's a bit, it's advanced for a nurse. I mean, I'm not saying nurses don't need to know it, but it, um, it, it, what is important is that you know that insulin um, causes potassium to shift inside the cell. So it, it works by making this, you know, these pumps work. It has a, its own pump, and it causes this potassium to shift inside the cell and then decreases the, um, the cellular volume um, the extracellular volume, which decreases the potassium level. And that's exactly how it works, and that's kind of how you should think about it. Email us anything you have a question about. Maybe even it's not, um, maybe you're not a Picmonic subscriber, but you have a question or something, it's fine. Send us an email, and we're going to get to you. Um, if you don't get your answer, if you didn't get your answer, question answered, and you really want to get it, um, just send it out. It's no big deal. Um, and... Um, that's it. That's all we have for tonight. I appreciate you guys coming. So we'll see you next week. I hope you learned something. And otherwise, have a great night. Send us any questions you have. Good luck studying. So that completes our pre-recorded webinar on electrolytes made easy. In this last part, we talked about the seven picmonics that cover sodium, hyponatremia, hypernatremia, mannitol, IV solutions, digoxin, and insulin. Go learn these topics now at picmonic.com or on the iOS or Android apps. Just click the playlist link below this video that covers the entire list of the 24 picmonics that were covered in this three-part series. Using the link below will also get you a 20% discount off picmonic premium. And if you need a little guidance on how to use the system to really maximize your studying, check out our getting started video linked below.
And until next time, good luck studying.